The tension of competitive rivalries is often a key ingredient for creating art. A young Renaissance painter named Leonardo da Vinci engaged in a battle of words with the great master Michelangelo. Rock and Picasso were so similar in their cubist style, it was difficult to tell who painted what. The traditionalist Brahms and the avant-garde Wagner created a division among classical music enthusiasts. Fights were known to break out before premieres. And long nights on the road would provide opportunity for musical warfare between jazz greats Bird and Coltrane. One musical art form born in the inner city with roots in Jamaican dance hall music embraced this spirit of competition like no other, creating a provocative world of words, taunts, and insults. This musical art form would create a culture called hip hop, and thus began the Battle of the MCs. I never thought I would see the day where I met or heard the wackest rapper in the world, because I've heard a lot of wack rappers, but he very well possibly could be the worst rapper in the world. Dre is a BG. I mean a baby gangster. And he ain't even a gangster. The streets gotta know that this nigga's a fucking freak. He's a phony. You know what I'm saying? He's a fucking phony. Come on, Nori. Nice, man. I love you, Nori. Step your rap game up, man. My man Black Child said it the best. Who wants beef with a snitch? Wow. Are <laughs> y'all was running your mouth complaining about summer jam? I was in flip-flops in the south of France. So, yo, 50, what's the definition of a wankster, man? I mean, what is that? Ja Rule, Irv Gotti. Fuck your little bitch ass up, nigga. Come here, give me a kiss, you little faggot. <laughs> Yo, they dissing you, son. Yo, he's a hater, he's a hater. This dude ain't saying nothing about me. I said, you acting like a bitch. He said, you acting like a bitch. Come at me. If I was writing about me, I would kill me. I didn't even know him. And I jumped in that shit head first and said, nigga, fuck you, whatever. I'm gonna get at 50. He's a he's the real wankster. You got about 15 different beefs that you can pull up. Cold Crush and Fantastic. The real Roxanne and Roxanne Shantae. Homo D caught Busy B. Jane, Okuji rap. I can out rap Ice T. <laughs> <laughs> Ice Cube versus NWA. That was a vicious battle. <laughs> it, was, it was from the heart. Jerry Young. B.I.G. Snoop and Corrupt. Almond and Cube. Oh. You don't like Hammer. Tupac and Hammer got into it. <laughs> the Benzino thing, that's punk shit. Tupac, rest in peace, and Biggie, rest in peace. The East Coast and the West Coast. That East Coast, West Coast East thing. Coast, West Coast. East Coast, West Coast. East Coast, West Coast. East, West Coast. East Coast, West Coast. East Coast, West Coast. East Coast, West Coast beat. But I'm not old school. Cause I bust these new cats ass. Wow. When cannabis and LL Cool J went at it. Source people rushed the loonies people. God. Jay Z made comments about Mob D. He a bitch ass nigga for saying that. He said I'm about a dollar. Who the fuck is Fifty Cent? He said I'm a Mac 11. I'm a higher caliber MC. That's no question. I said, nigga, I don't go fuck where you from. Nigga, you in LA, nigga, and you a lose tonight, nigga. Jay Z and Nas. DMX is cursing out Ja Rule and all these different interviews. Don't fuck with dogs. Actually, somebody got shot in the club that night. We was there. <laughs> KRS versus Nelly. Nelly battling Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha! A gang of drama. Beef. 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 Earliest battle, I think, on history, or most famous battle, is Busy B and Kumo D. This battle took place over two decades ago, and is still being heard today. I heard about that battle in Brooklyn as a graffiti artist. That's how, like, an, like as an atomic explosion went out. That was in Harlem World Stage, 116th Street, Lenox Avenue. Right here, Harlem World. You understand what I'm saying? This is the place. It's a old, it's a supermarket now. They got Met Food. But that's the world-famous Harlem World right there. Legendary Harlem World. Busy B was more of a, what they would call a celebrity club rapper. Somebody go, ooh, ah, ooh, ooh, ah. He would just kind of go into a club. You know, Busy B was known to bite people's rhymes. He'd take a little bit of your rhyme and a little bit of his rhyme, but he could go in and rock the party. Somebody say, yeah, you so sucker. Yeah. 
Busy B represented the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Bob and Bob and Dang a Dang Diggy Diggy. And Kumo D was more of a serious rapper who who wrote rhymes and was more, he was in the treacherous three. Hey, good luck, this is the last time you'll ever see this picture. <laughs> Only a few <laughs> battle masters know how to beat the party MC, because in a lot of cases, the party MC will look like he won, but if you listen to it on wax, or if you listen to it once you got the tape home, you would probably hear more poetic value in the other guy. But the party MC is about the live interaction. A lot of people will say that it was unfair for Kumo D to really battle Busy B, who wasn't really a battle MC. But Busy B was a battle MC. He just battled in the old fashioned way, which was to basically rock, who can rock the party the most. The battle with Busy B was spontaneous. It wasn't planned. I was actually the host of the MC contest. And Busy B, he's a character. He's one of the funniest guys in hip hop, without question. And Busy B comes in like Ali used to do at the training camps. I'm knocking out all bums. I'm coming in here. I'm zooming in. The chief rocker busy B, you know what I'm saying? Let me take a picture with his car, because this is my trophy. Let me take a picture with it right now. So he bent down and he was taking pictures with the trophy or whatever. And it was like comical. And one, it always takes one heckler. So one heckler looks up and says, you can't beat him. And Busy B says, I don't care who it is. I beat anybody. I, you know, I don't want 800 of these in a row, taking pictures and he's posing or whatever. Just give me the trophy right now, because nobody can beat me. I'm Chief Rocker Busy B. I'll be back to claim this in about 25 minutes, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to let everybody else go ahead and do what they got to do, because I'm going to win this thing. And the guy says again, but you can't beat Mo D. And he says, I don't care who it is. Anybody get in here is going to be suicide. That's it. I'm knocking out all bums. I'm knocking out all bums. I don't even know what I expected him to do. Like, was he supposed to turn around and say, no, I can't beat him? Because that wouldn't be, you know, that's not my cheesemo. <laughs> that wouldn't work. So he did what he was supposed to do, but my ego was just out of whack at the time. So I said, I can't believe he didn't acknowledge that he couldn't beat me in a battle. And so I go up to the guy that's, that's in, in Harlem World to put my name on the list. He said, you getting in the battle? I said, yeah. I said, and put me on right after Busy B. I was on stage doing it. It was my turn to rock. I felt every time it's my turn to rock, I like to enjoy the crowd, make the crowd enjoy me. So I get on the mic, I do my regular ball with the ball, but dang, the dang, dang, rocking and making the people, oh yeah, scream, holler and all that, right? You know, the competition was supposed to be over. Busy B rocked the party. Like, like if you listen to the tape, Busy B was already on stage, had already rocked the party completely. People were totally satisfied with him. Once again, MC Busy B with Cool D. So then they say, oh, we got one more contestant. You know, you know, we didn't know he was going to get down, you know, so we're going to let him rap. And at that time, me, I'm not paying none of that no mind because I'm not even worrying about nobody trying to snap on me or say something about me. So I'm not even figuring that's going to happen, right? So I go downstairs, I'm partying. Jeez, man, I took some time to rock the house. You know what I'm saying? Look here. <laughs> now we go to the hotel, cool out. I got the limousine outside, I got girls, I got the champagne. We go have some fun and work it out. Two party people in the place to be. My name is MC Kumo D from the Treacherous Three. My man LA Sunshine in the place to be. We gonna get a little something straight here in the place to be. How many people think Busy B Starsky rocked the house? I hear that in the place to be. Yeah. He did rock the crowd. But this is a battle. But if y'all notice it or not, you know, I heard a lot of shit, you know, Busy B's popping shit, saying he'll take out any MC and I all that. Let him do it I alone. give it to the man, he know how to rock the crowd, but when it come to having rhyme, no way he can fuck around. And I'm gonna prove that right now. So now I'm putting in your mind that what you just saw wasn't really anything. What to do now? Hold on, Busy B, I don't mean to be bold. Put that bar, do the bar bullshit on hold. We're gonna get right down to the nitty grit. I'm gonna tell you a little something why you ain't shit. There ain't an MC cock that you don't hug. You even bitch your name from the love bug. Can I fight a nigga's name, miss some low down shut shit? Up, shut up. If you was money, man, you'd be kind of fit. Crowd is like going berserk because they're like, I can't believe he's attacking them like this. And it's by surprise, nobody knew what was gonna happen. So I'm at the lower level, I'm partying, we down there drinking, you know, and they coming out, yo, biz, yo, biz. I'm saying, what happened? 
Yo, Biz, yo, D going crazy over you. I said, what, who? Kumo D disrespecting you, calling you all kind of this, saying this and that. I'm like, yeah. Kumo D just comes out of left field and just demolished him. He shut him down. Kumo D kind of took Busy B apart. And they actually got it on the radio. The mixtape that floated around the world forever. And from that point on, the tape became like a record. Everybody had the tape, and people would run up to me and be like, I heard what you did to Busy B. Cause you're faking the funk And at the end of this uh, rhyme You uh, can call uh, me uh, uncle uh, Modi rock shock the house Call me uncle Rock the house Y'all like house. this y'all like Now imagine going from From Bobbity Bobbity Danga Dang Diggy Diggy This is a, The changing of the guard Hold on brother man Don't you say nothing I'm not finished yet I gotta tell you something too hot to trot, I'm here to rock the spot I'm gonna rock your ass whether you like it or not The battle between Cool Mo D and Busy B gave birth to the lyrical MC. You're not number one, you're not even the best and you can't win no real MC contest You now have to make sense of what you said in order for us to give you power To tell you the truth, that might have been the best thing for him It worked out for me and we've been friends before that. Never stop being friends. Yeah. Chief Rocker. All right. So let me know when the anniversary's gonna be. Like I said, no surprise attack, no dumb shit. Uh, <laughs> at the airport when you arrive. <laughs> know that he's just cool mode, not busy being. And I'm gonna see him straighten out it all out like all the notes. I'm still king. Have to battle now when the chief comes down. If Kumo D had a lost that battle. Nothing we're saying today would be said. The way we're saying nothing, it would not exist. We would all today would have to start our rhyme with well, bob a de bob a dang a dang dang a dang. We've always done something with words, and we've always done it in a way where I think it's kind of competitive. What was uh, Socrates and Aristotle and all those people doing with words when they had these debates in Greek society all the way back to Africa? you'll find that there was wordplay and there was some sort of competition with words. What are debates about? War of words. How can you one-upmanship? How can you manipulate words and move the crowd or convince people? You take it all the way from Africa to slave times, you're dealing with all types of word games that people have played, whether it was the Brer Rabbit Tales or signifying the monkey, even mama jokes, where the object of ridicule was the master who didn't know that the slaves were just substituting somebody's mama to have him be the object of the joke. H. Rap Brown wrote a book called Die Nigga Die, and in that book he kind of outlines what he was doing in the 50s, and he describes people standing around in a circle and what it sounds like a cipher today, where you have a bunch of brothers standing around rhyming against each other. On one young nigga, pass the mic on a two, pass the mic on a three, young nigga, two pop huh? on you. One of the immediate predecessors uh, uh, to rap was this uh, game called The Dozens. And The Dozens really was a, a rhyme game where you talked about people's moms. At your mama house. Yeah. Your mama? Oh, your mama's so fat. Well, your mama's favorite game was fight the shower. I remember talking to uh, Rudy Ray Moore. You know, people know him as Dolomite, and he described how people had all this wordplay when he was coming up. Dolomite is my name, and rapping and tapping is my game. I'm the one that killed Monday and whooped Tuesday and put Wednesday in the hospital. Rhyming is a part of, uh, you know, what you have to do when you do certain things. You have to make it rhyme. When you talk trash on a certain level, it has to rhyme. <laughs> the DJ said, hear the microphone, somebody tell everybody how great I am. That's why early rap records were always about the DJ. It was like, Grandmaster Flash cut so on, and my DJ is this, and my DJ is that. Now this MC has the microphone, so what he would do is say, yeah, you know, by the way, you know, the DJ's this, but I'm kind of nice and I'm kind of fly and I live in a house and I got this and the girls want me and the girls would scream. But then the next guy would get on the mic and say, yeah, you know, 
the last guy was kind of good, but I'm a little better. And by the way, I was with his sister. Everyone in their own mind, by their own right, thanks they're number one. I'm ill. I'm tight. I see a lot of talent, but I see no competition. But you will never fuck with me lyrically, because I'm on some other shit. You got to be able to do what I do, plus. We've been heavyweight champions in the world for the last seven, eight years. Yeah, no. Nope. But you know, hey, I'm ready for anybody. We got the number one round niggas in the game, period, right here, sitting in front of you. Like I said earlier, I deserve a Lifetime Achievement Award. <laughs> Rap started off as a, as a con full contact sport. It was highly aggressive. It's going to be aggressive. Hip-hop is competitive. Find a rapper that doesn't think he's the best. And, and I bet you he won't be a signed artist. I bet you he'll just be some guy that's playing around. The battle was like the way you took your steps to showing that you was the greatest. MCing was about being the freshest, being the dopest. If you're going to say you're number one, you got you to gotta prove it. You know, you step up money, then I'm going to step up. You know what I'm saying? Two people can't be in the same room saying they're the best. They're going to have to battle. They're going to have to prove it. Get down with the staff. Get on the mic on my right. Let's go to the stage. Let's hit me and you. Forget that record. Forget all of that. Just hit the drum machine and let's go. My man G Rap, pull this all on you. So get on the mic and do what you want to. No thanks. Back to you, Dick. It's not about how you look or what you did, how many bitches you fucked, how many rings you got, or none of that. It's who can rhyme the best. That's what it's about, yo. Straight up being on the street corners, you know what I mean? It was no disrespect. It was just a, a thing of a skills. Showing who got more. It was kind of like practice. If you ever was on the Little League, if you ever was running around the hood, it's your practice to get set for the game. The game is out here in the industry. You know what I mean? So if you can't make it on the streets, you can't come out on the industry because anybody can test you at any time. And the thing is, you ain't got to be the one that's coming out dissing anybody, but they will come at you to see where your skills is at. So Try to keep your sore shop, you got to do it in battle on the streets. That's where it's from. It's like the difference between a uh, pro ball and a street ball. You know what I'm saying? Pro ball is cold, and that's where the money is at. But the street ball niggas is the nicest ones. You know what I'm saying? And, the way they do moves like that is more personal, it's more competitive, you know what I'm saying? That's what battling is to rap. You're never gonna be able to get as deep into competition as you will in the ghetto community. In the hood, they really wanna win. You gotta win to get out the hood. Because you gotta remember, being the best dancer is probably the best thing you're ever gonna be. You know, you don't have that many opportunities. So to be the best rapper is a big thing. I think any MC worth their salt has been in a battle has been in rhyme competition one point or the other. So even your most thugged out, street cat, hat backwards, go tooth wearing, I'm just hustling, has been in a battle or has had some sort of rhyme competition. Every year, I write a battle rhyme for the entire top 10 of Billboard. No disrespect, it's just the way I practice. Always remember, if you're in the top 10, of Billboard, I have a rhyme to battle you, straight up, that will destroy your career. Check it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now listen, I say it's great in this world to always be an MC, but somebody in this world is always beefing with me. Every time that I could rock it, Supernatural does the stun it. But do you know what it's like to live the life of the hunted? Everywhere you walk, yo, you're always a target. Whether I'm shopping or buying food at the market, cats want to battle me and kill my carcass. Yeah, that's when the hour really is the darkest. But listen to me, Spark, this as far as I can free. I learned from Cool Mo D and Busy B when KRS won this MC share. It's probably the one that I think sticks out in everybody's mind and I think probably set a standard uh, was the battle between the Juice Crew and BDP, Boogie Down Productions. As hip-hop grew in the mid-80s, New York's different neighborhoods began to take credit for its creation. Was it the Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, or Harlem? Me and my man C. Shan made an uh, <laughs> intermission record for Queensbridge parties that we used to have in the park out there, Queensbridge. The 70s and early 70s is when, you know, the hip hop started out there. They was playing in the park. Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen we got MC Shan and Molly Shan Mall in the house tonight. house tonight. They just came from off tour. They want to tell you a little story about where they come from. Mr. Magic, who at that time in the mid 80s was the pinnacle and the height of what it meant to be an on-air DJ who played hip-hop music. He was the man um, known around the world, Mr. Magic's Rap Attack. And here you had up-and-coming artists, K-1000, 
KRS One, Scott LaRock, uh, bringing their record to Mr. Magic, and him not feeling it. This is how we barge in. Yo, this is Boogie Down Productions. KRS, Scott LaRock. Here's our tip. We're performing right there. <laughs> like this. So obviously, Mr. Magic is like, who are you? Get out of here. And at the same time, Mr. Magic was also supporting uh, a number of MCs that included Master Ace and Craig G and Big Daddy Kane and all these other folks that were collectively just called the Juice Crew. We leave frustrated. Magic dissed us. He wouldn't even give us the time. He wouldn't even, who he think he is. Now, somewhere along the line, we get the impression that Mr. Magic said, our tape was whack, whack, whack. He heard it and said it was garbage. I said, garbage? MC Shan is garbage. So I went back to my shelter, sitting amongst 600 men, <laughs> bugging out. I'm sitting on the edge of my bed, I'm writing South Bronx, South, South Bronx, South Bronx. So my issue was what MC Shan said in the record. You love to hear the story again and again about how it all got started way back when. The monument is right in your face. Sit and listen for a while to the name of the place. The bridge, the bridge, the bridge, the bridge, the bridge, Queens Bridge. I said, uh-uh. It was $25 an hour for an eight track studio. We were there two hours, $50, a lot of money. That, that, what you hear on the South Bronx is one take. Scott was complaining that I took too long. The guy didn't even mix the record, there's no mix. And we kept one, and we gave one to Red Alert. DJ Red Alert, one of New York's premier club and radio DJs, played parties at New York's Latin Quarters. And that's when your heart stops, right there, heart stops. Cause right then and there, Red Alert can tell you to get out. It's corny. Look, man, you ain't got a shot. Red Alert will tell you in a minute. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't like the record. You, you don't have a shot. And your career's over. We wait and one song goes on. When he gonna play the record, he probably don't like it. Now the song go on. Boom, our song comes on. The whole place stops. Yo, what's up, Blastmaster KRS-1? And then doing like this. And by the time we got to, and I'm from the South Bronx, the South South Bronx place erupted. South Bronx, South Bronx, South Bronx, South Bronx, South Bronx. Red Alert played that record three times in a row. Play nothing else. After the chorus went, the crowd, every, he tried to put on another record, they sang the South Bronx chant over that record. So he'd have to put it on again and put it on again. You can't imagine the feeling. Correct. For 86, suckers. <laughs> So to go against Sham was like, meant like a lot. So when KRS did that, that's when everybody that listened to rap had to really sit down and take it serious. After the triumph at Latin Quarters, krs One star began to rise, with South Bronx on the radio as a direct challenge to hip hop's premier MC. Chris claimed that I said that hip hop started in Queensbridge, which I didn't. In the beginning of the song, you hear Marley say, oh, they want to tell you a story about where they come from. That's the key word, where they come from. The bridge, the, 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 the bridge. Well, Chris took it and he's like thinking, oh, Marley talking all this stuff. Everybody knows hip hop started in the Bronx. Cool Herc, every, you know. Time for the Bronx to come back, we came back live. So was there like a lot of resentment and everything after the record? Is it like a rivalry going on out there? Yeah, say that. Yeah. Yeah. My response to his response was, kill that noise, because you can't mess around. I don't really mind being criticized for those who try to make fame on my name. South Bronx, kill a kill that noise. South Bronx, kill a kill that noise. And I was just like, yo, please kill that noise. South Bronx, kill that noise. South Bronx came out, then kill that noise came out, 
Then I put out the bridges over, because it's all I had. These are rhymes that I was saying. So I ran back in the studio the next week and, and made this record, The Bridge Is Over. I didn't need to be in this hip hop game with all the people in my camp, the cold chilling and all, you know, everybody was negative. Even my own clique tried to play me low. Shan's my man and all that, but I think Chris, Chris kind of came out the victor a little. Didn't need the criticism, didn't need the people, you know, my own crew dissing me and dogging me. I found myself representing the Bronx. I mean, like, representing. I didn't realize how much a record did, you know, what a record did for pride, what a record did for esteem. The Bronx was alive again. I'm from Queens. He was going mad and keeps on making it. Brooklyn keeps on taking it. Bronx keeps creating it. Queens keeps on faking it. Yeah. Ship so hot, we still had to fuck with it. So if you said anything about me, I was going to get you, no matter who you was, where you was from, why you was there. I'm still the only guy in the whole game that represented and battled the whole borough by myself. <laughs> if you thought MC Shan lost to KRS-One or if the Juice Crew lost, they were able to come back and still be legends because the hip hop community was forgiving. It's like, OK, they got you on that battle, but there's another tomorrow. I've had the six cars in my yard. I've had the Mercedes. I still got the BM, the motorcycles, and all of this in my yard right now. I've had that. I'm, in, I'm talking about planes and boats now. I ain't into cars and Chris. That's for you little punks. <laughs> I'm talking planes and boats because I spit shit directly being aimed at throats. I got doorbells with real bitches singing the notes. <laughs> I got new Chris lines, man. I got new lines to burn to the... If there was no me, tell me would there ever be a Chris? No QB? Tell me would there ever be a diss? Thank God and Miss Parker for the fact that you're here, but thank me for your career, you hear? MC Shan could have won the battle simply by ignoring me. I'd be nowhere. There'd be no KRS-One, there'd be no 12 albums, no Stop the Violence movement, no Human Education Against Lies, no Temple of Hip Hop, nothing. It was because MC Shan understood hip hop that he said, oh no, this guy's stepping to me? By the late 80s, LL Cool J had become a superstar which increasingly in hip-hop meant he had become a target. Ooh, listen to the way I slay Your crew, damn it, uh, damn it, uh, damn it, uh, damn it In To the Break of Dawn, LL Cool J shot back at all his rivals. MC Hammer Took my old gym teacher ain't supposed to rap Cool Mo D Got the nerd to have him Star Trek shades on And Ice-T Mr. Pusher Man, give me a fix So I can show you I'm immune To the Rumpa Room tunes You little hip-hop raccoon LL Cool J and his opponents brought the MC battle out of the clubs And on to the national stage Where the rules were very different I took the cover right home to the bathroom And the immortal words of LL hard as hell Your broad wears it well She's the reason that your record sold a few copies But your rhymes are Where I was coming from, being from a gang culture in L.A. street If somebody said something about you in the street You immediately wanted to go see them And it was like, you know, I can say something about you But you can't say nothing about me <laughs> As crack cocaine ravaged urban America in the 1980s, rap music began to become a microphone for the rage and despair of the inner cities. That rage began to influence the music itself, and in no place like Los Angeles. So Easy uh, told me to write a song for him. 
So I wrote a song. I wrote a song called Boys in the Hood. I talked to Eric into doing a rhyme. The song was Boys in the Hood. He was like, yo, I ain't never rapped before. I can't do this. So I eventually talked him into doing it. You know, he put on some dark glasses and we cut the lights down and the whole shit, you know, and he did it. Next day, you know, we had a hit record. Woke up quick at about noon. Just thought that I had to be in Compton soon. I got You know, one day it was like, you know, we're going to call this NWA. Niggas with attitudes. Now I don't know if Dre or Easy was the one that came up with the name because they was together when they when they told me. So I was with it. I was like, cool. Before releasing NWA's first album, Easy E released Easy Does It, an Easy E solo album, written by Ice Cube, produced by Dr. Dre, and essentially made by NWA. This the real album. It's a new album. New Easy E album. For the fact, Easy Royalty statement came in. So I just know that this money is about to be broke up five ways, you know, and uh, everybody's going to get paid because everybody contributed. You know, even though Easy e was the name, N.W.A. put that record together. OK, now a lot of people now see I was just confused a little bit about that. Could you explain like N.W.A. and Easy e OK, it's an all star group. It's all of us. Me, Dre, Yella, Ren, Ice Cube. And uh, and it was me. like, nah, so, nah, this is this is Easy money. We getting NWA money. I'm like, Easy, Easy, and NWA the same thing. It ain't no difference. And mine is me solo. That's my album. It's by myself solo. What he wanted to do was keep the Easy E money for himself, and then when the NWA record money came in, he wanted to split that and cut himself into that. So that's when it just started getting real hectic. People started asking me questions I couldn't answer them about my contract, how long I'm gonna sign, all these type of things where I didn't know. People have been telling me, you know, asking me about a solo album, should I should do one, but uh, I'm all about my group, man. Established rock manager Jerry Heller was brought on to help run Ruthless Records. The good thing I like about Jerry, he don't care who hates him. You know, he's, it's business. It's, don't take it personal, it's business. You know, they say the same thing about Bill Gates. They say a lot of people hate Bill Gates, but hey, if it wasn't for Jerry Heller and Eric, it wouldn't be no Dr. Dre's. It wouldn't be no Ice Cube's. It wouldn't be a lot of this stuff going on now. We were on the Straight Outta Compton tour, and um, some of the people from Priority Record came down there with the platinum records, and they came down and they set these $75,000 checks in front of all of us. What's this for? And he was like, okay, this is for, you know, record sales and for an advance on the next record. So we like, cool. But there was a but on the end of that. But NWA is not a group legally because there are no contracts signed. See, all, up until then, everything was just verbal on a homeboy level. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. And that's it. And this is how we're going to get paid. So Jerry Heller comes in and he goes, yo, you guys are not a group until these contracts are signed. You can't get these checks until these contracts are signed. So seeing $75,000 sitting on the table, and you know, we some kids out of Compton. We've seen most at one time two grand. So we like, okay, cool. Cube was the only smart one at the time. You know, he didn't sign the contract. They say the pen is mightier than the sword is, is also true. You know, that moment messed us up for a long time. Q was just more business oriented than all of them. And, you know, he wanted, he, he did it right. You know, hey, I'm not signing nothing. I caught Jerry Heller, Easy e hand in the cookie jar. And I was willing to say, you know, fuck it. I caught y'all, you know, just pay me what you owe me and we can keep on rolling. But, you know, they wanted to save face. They felt like if they paid me, they would have to pay everybody else. And, uh, you know, so they was kind of pretty much like, fuck you, nigga, what you going to do, go solo? Ice Cube's first solo album, America's Most Wanted, went gold in only two weeks. Yo, man, I'm more than happy on what's been going on. I'm more than happy with the move, more than happy to really get my career going like I wanted to go. You know what I'm saying? You said a million copies later. Here we are. It's only five weeks into the album. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I can't do nothing but be happy, you know? And some people told me, yo, I made a bad decision. What you think? When NWA split, different crews went with different people. And, you know, 
they was in, in conflict with each other. On America's Most Wanted album, I didn't diss them at all. I didn't say nothing about N.W.A. Not even one word about nobody in the group. So for them to come out on they shit, you know, 100 miles of running and diss me, you know, that was their attitude. So now I was four, the fifth couldn't make it. The numbers even, now I'm leaving. You know, I did a little diss back and jacking for beats. And if I jack you and you keep coming, I have your marks 100 miles and run. run. Hey, yo, yo, this is MC Ren from NWA, and you back with me on Our West, you know what I'm saying? That fool Ice Cube put a diss on this record, yo. Hey, right, but why don't y'all tell them what we think about Ice Cube? You know what I'm saying? That's what time it is, you know what I'm saying? And that fool mind is playing tricks on him on Our West, check it out. <laughs> While the first songs contain only mild disses, the beef escalates with NWA's real niggas. They came back and did a bigger diss on me, on their album, Niggas for Life. A message to Benedict Arnold. Yo, be original, your shit is sloppy Get off your dick, you motherfucking carbon copy Only reason niggas speaking your record is cause they thought it was up Tryna be like us, sound like us, dress like us And then I came back with the death certificate On his death certificate album, Ice Cube recorded No Vaseline A vicious attack on N.W.A. and Jerry Heller God damn it, I'm glad y'all set it off Used to be hard, now you're just wet and soft No Vaseline Living with the whites, one big house and not another nigga in sight I started off with too much cargo Drop four niggas now I'm making all the dough and No Vaseline Yellow boys on your team so you're losing Hey yo Dre, stick to producing Calling me on a fuck, you been a dick Easy E saw your ass and went in it quick It was, it was from the heart Cause you get fucked out your green by a white boy With no Vaseline we heard it, we was like, woo. When I first heard No Vaseline, I laughed. And the first thing I did is picked up the fucking phone. I called him, I said, hey, what's up? I said, you and you and Q fucking or something? After No Vaseline, shit, that was it. Now let's play Big Bang, take Little Bang. Try to diss Ice Cube, it wasn't worth it because the broomstick picked your ass off. We didn't up the ante for this or battle records as far as we're concerned. With your manager, fella. Fucking MC Red, not the break. And yeah, but if they were smart as me, Easy to be hanging from a tree with no Vaseline. Just imagine a little bit of gasoline. Light him up, burn him up, flame more. So that Jerry Kill is cool. I never knew the drama behind it would be as much a part of the success and the fame. You got the drama and the bullshit. I got the drama and the bullshit before I got the fame and fortune, you know, so. Yeah, I was real surprised, shocked. NWA never responded to No Vaseline, but the drama within NWA was far from finished. When one person decides he deserves a little bit more money than the other person, and that's when everything gets all, you know, crossed up. Don't trust no motherfuckers, because everybody in the music industry is out to get you. Several years after signing with Eazy-E and Jerry Heller, Dr. Dre also found fault with NWA's compensation practices. The white boy came in and kind of uh, fucked it up. And his name is? Jerry Heller. <laughs> I don't know Jerry Heller. <laughs> kind of uh, pulled easy to the side and he sold out, sold his soul. Bound by the contract signed on their first tour and with nowhere else to turn, Dr. Dre with an NWA bodyguard named Suge Knight started Death Row Records. Why did, why did Ice Cube leave and then why did Dre leave? Same reason. The ends wasn't right. Point blank. <laughs> Get funny with the ends. You know, had to do my thing, man. Try to make another people money. It's time to make Dre some ends. Hip-hop myth alleges Suge Knight and others visited Easy e and Jerry Heller with baseball bats to secure Dre's release from Ruthless Records. Yeah. It's easy said, like, y'all came with them at bats, you know what I'm saying? Nah, and man. Swinging and all that old thing, you know what I'm saying? Nah, Dr. Dre came that way at Easy. you know what I'm saying? Is that the way you got in the I don't song? know what he's talking about. You know what I'm, I'm saying? I'm innocent. Word, word. Yeah. Work. So what was, what was the actual settlement as far as you know? What Basically, I'm Dre was signed to me as an exclusive producer and an exclusive artist. So I owned him for six years. In order for Dre to make his record deal, I had to make the deal possible for him to do it. So I get a percentage of his record sales, whether he produces as an artist and whether he produced Snoop, Rage, Daz, Corrupt, or whoever else off death row. You don't see jack shit to come from death row. I make money off Dre's record sales. Yeah! How many niggas out there like Easy e Fuck it, Easy motherfucking E!
We don't love that nigga. He can eat these motherfucking nuts. Really now, just death row, big baby. Dr. Dre, Snoop, and Death Row came after Easy e on the Chronics. Fuck with Dre Day. I'm directing um, Fuck with Dre Day. There was more vicious between Dre and Easy because that's the first time you really got to see, like, you know, uh, the belittling of a fellow MC, you know, in a video. The caricature of Easy e the caricature of Jerry Heller. Excuse me, Dre, we're setting up the scene when we shoot Easy e You want him shot with the 32 or the AK-47? Uh, use the AK. The AK. Fully automatic. Fully automatic. Yeah. <laughs> we picked the wrong nigga to fuck with. <laughs> yeah, we could do an NWA Reunion album if it's on Death Row. Mm -hmm. you know death saying? Row. Without yeah. Easy. Without Easy. Something called NWE. NWE. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Niggas without Easy. Come, John, John, John. Easy E responded on wax and video with real motherfucking jeans. Damn E, they tried to fade you on Dre Day. But Dre Day only met Easy Day Day. All of a sudden, Dr. Dre is the G thing. But on his old album covers, he was the she thing. Wait, don't you remember Dre was back in the days? He used to be in a world class wrecking crew. He used to wear lipstick, lace, mascara, biker shorts, and everything. See, a lot of people don't remember all that when he did the cabbage patch and the fly and Dr. Dre, 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 Dre. Dre. And he didn't start hollering Compton until he got with me. But that's explaining how it is in Compton. Oh, yeah. That, you remember he, on a song called N.W.A. did called Express Yourself? He said, I never smoke weed or cess because it's known to give a brother brain damage and brain damage on the mic don't manage. Now he's smoking weed and low ride and all of a sudden in 93 and claim to be an OG. OGs do stuff back in the day. Dre is a BG. That means a baby gangster. Journalist Kevin Powell interviewed Easy e for Vibe magazine just before Easy's death in 1995. And he, he was deeply hurt by the, 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 the belittling of him because Ice Cube had dissed him. <laughs> I'm saying no Vaseline very hard. And then Dre and Snoop dissed him. It didn't seem the way, you know, like he had recovered emotionally the way maybe Shan or, or Karis Wayne could have recovered or LL and Kumo D and stuff like that. And I think that was the first time I began to think, like, man, this is kind of going in a different direction now. I think that the violence came into the whole sport of battling once the lyrical content changed. I won't quit, I talk a lot of shit, but fuck it all up, cause I'll be ready to throw them up, but niggas don't want to slang them, cause I bring them, I'll be 165, but I'm hot till I fucking die, so what you want to do, bring your whole fucking crew, and my clock, I had niggas running up the block. Hip-hop is an expression of all kinds of energy, I mean, whether it's positive energy or whether it's the energy of those who would be drug dealers but were instead afforded an opportunity to record music. But of course there are artists who come from a real rugged time and a rugged energy and express a rugged point of view. And so when they get into battles, the battles get more difficult. Like now when you listen to uh, Brothers Battle and you listen to the lyrics they say, I mean, you know, they're going at it like, you know, like, like straight up like it's mafia threats. You take me out, I take your family out. I kill your people, you kill mine. What you say, motherfucker? But if you're trying to kill your ass, break your fucking neck. I'm talking shit. I'm gonna kill you, I'm gonna shoot you. And I murder this person. I hate you, you hate me. Ask your mama, here's your name. I had sex with her. Mother, your sister, and your girlfriend. And your mother, your daughter. And I tie your he mother up. Throw your baby out the window. Cut your head off and bowl it down a bowling alley. Kidnap your kids and shit. Kidnap your aunt. I'll say something disrespectful to somebody else's kids about their kids. And when I say that, I'm saying it with intentions to go there. You know have hip hop don't have a heart nowadays. Tupac has no heart. What's that say? Heartless. And I beat them motherfuckers down. Oh, no, no, don't do that. No. Lyrically and thematically. West Coast gangster rap emphasized skills on the street as much, if not more, than skills on the mic. Like some rappers like mix a lot and all of them and try to rap about shit out here. They can't do it because they wasn't around it, but we could do it because we was around it all. Right. Like you we can't do everything. I've been mean, killings, robbery, murder, thieving, and everything. The whole nine yards, dope dealing, everything. Everything you hear on our records is true. The ever-increasing need to keep it real further blurred the line between artistic differences and street warfare. Comic. It's funny because when he first came out, I mean, he was doing like hip, real, like 
old school hip hop records, you know what I'm saying, with the scratch and hook, that and all. But what I used to love, I mean, we all know metaphors, you know. I, I've been in the game since I was 14, so I know metaphors and do this. I created I Used to Love It in 1994. You know, it was a story that I could tell about the evolution of hip hop and the stages that I seen hip hop go from just the pure innocent to to the along with raw and just being freestyle like to to the pro black from pro black and then going to the west coast which i said was good the jazz not black music is black music and it's all good i wasn't salty she was with the boys in the hood because i wasn't salty she was with the boys in the hood he talking about this girl that he was in love with you know she's supposed to be hip-hop and he's so in love with her but when she go out here she get fucked up what you mean nigga? why it was cool larry wells it went but when it came over here, it's fucked up now. The love in W.A. Ice Cube, King T, Compton's Most Wanted, Too Short. And we felt it was a diss. So, at least I did. I mean, everybody did, but, you know, I was the first one with the pen, so that's how that started. <laughs> so, it was fuck Common. Ice Cube took that as a direct attack and came back and destroyed Common when that wasn't even the nature of the battle that Common was presenting. For their first song together as the West Side Connection, Ice Cube, Mac-10, and Dub C came after Common in West Side Slaughterhouse. Me, Cube, and WC, you know, got together in the studio one day and everybody just wrote their verses right there. I used to love a mad because we fucked her. Yeah, pussy wood bitch with no common sense. Hip hop started in the West. Ice Cube belling through the east without a vest. Yeah, he was wrong with that motherfucker. Yeah, Chicago is mine, nigga. He told Common his hood was his hood. West Side Slaughterhouse was so raw. Man, I seen that shit the other day, Holmes. That was one of the best rap videos ever. That shit was raw. Niggas had khaki suits on with blood all over them and in meat markets and socking beef and oh we was stupid with it and i heard it and at first i was like man i'm gonna let it go my first thing was like, i'm gonna let it go you know he dissed me i'm thinking like yo i grew up listening to cube you know i was happy that he knew who i was you know like that he even recognized me but i was hurt that he had dissed me a lot you know but it, overall i was just like all right that's cool kind of laughed it off and then um i seen ice cube and, and mac 10 and WC, they, they were on BET dissing me. I was like, okay, this is going too far. I'm going to defend myself now. A bitch snigger with an attitude named Q. Step to the con with a few. Common, known as a conscious rapper, took hip hop by surprise with his vicious counterattack, The Bitch in You. I wrote the first verse, and I remember going down to the Gavin in 1996, and I performed with De La Soul. And I stopped the music. My heart was beating like, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm about to say this first. And violate you, you a Muslim drinking brew. Your no nigga ain't no Mac 10. He's a 22. I seen you, Mac. You ain't say shit in And the crowd just gave me super love. Eventually, Common performed the bitch in you in Los Angeles, boldly dissing Ice Cube in his own city. Oh uh, man, I don't know what's gonna jump off. It's like, but I just was feeling the fury to a certain extent because it was just. I felt like Ice Cube and them was wrongly accusing me, so I was on the defensive at that point. Plus, I knew the verse was lighting the crowd up, too. Uh, on the dick of the east for your first release. Uh, your lease is up at the crib house, niggas get evicted. And videos are white. I thought that shit was whack. You know, because Common ain't even a rah-rah type nigga. You know? And, um, come on, Common. I didn't know what it was gonna escalate to. I didn't know. I was, like, prepared for anything. was getting out of hand. It was getting completely the fuck out of hand, for real. By the mid-90s, West Coast artists grew impatient with the New York bias against their work. Yeah, we could change the rap. Mercedes Benz built a car. I'm driving one. He ain't gonna get mad at me for driving it, is he? So what you started it? I'm gonna finish it. Period. With Dr. Dre's The Chronic, an entire coast demanded respect. Bow Down was the number one motherfucking record in the country. And we didn't have no spins on East Coast radio station. But as West Coast
Coast record sales soared, the East Coast felt something they had never felt before. Jealousy. Snoop and them had came out with a song called, you know what I mean, New York, New York. And they was kicking over our buildings and the videos and whatnot. And we had like took that like kind of personal, you know what I'm saying? Kicking over our buildings, you know what I'm saying? We not finna even get put in that point where we say fuck the East Coast because there's money over there, man. So it's like New York is the spot. New York, New York. They like the fuck dog the dog pad right now. So we had to go back at them, you know what I'm saying? We made a song called LA, LA. LA, LA, big city of dreams, but everything in LA ain't always what it seems. You might get fooled if you Those are the only niggas that at that time they came out and firmly stood up for NY at that time, know what I'm saying? Go back, check the records, and you See will hear tragedy mob D. Right. Video for it and all that. Cause we coming from Queens and get down. Well the East Coast, West Coast thing got big because it sold records, you know what I mean? Because it sold magazines, because it helped ratings for TV and radio. I mean, it was a lot of it was about money as far as I'm concerned. The media, media, media. The media, media, the 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 media, fuck the media, fuck the media, fuck the TV, fuck the media. All right. The media sees the so called East Coast, West Coast war, keeping a curious audience current with blow by blow coverage. <laughs> Many non-related events and grievances were attributed to the beef, and sensational coverage by magazines, radio stations, and television made artists, labels, and fans take sides. Aimed suspiciously immediately following Shakur's shooting in New York on November 6th. The East Coast versus West Coast battle. To the reported threats on Combs Live. Good night strikes towering above. Most of noticed the huge biceps itching the bus to issue. Heard there was a contract out on my life, said Combs. West Coast, West Coast, West Coast, West Coast, you know. Yeah, the Goodfellas thing was definitely purposeful. The whole mafia reference was definitely purposeful because at this point, Death Row was the most feared entity in the music industry. And we loved the fact that these cats agreed to pose in these black outfits. We thought it was hot, you know what I'm saying? Death Row Records had a publicist named George Price at the time. And in the middle of us laying out the cover, George Price calls and he says, whatever you do, make sure the letters on the cover are in red. You know what I'm saying? I've had plenty problems with people that live on my block. They ain't start no whole Brooklyn thing like this, East, like Best Eye against Brownsville. They ain't start no whole big thing like that. Controversy sells. The rappers didn't take it to another level. The, the companies took it to another level. My whole career was never, I had never been in an interview where they didn't ask me about East Coast, West Coast. East Coast, West Coast beef. There ain't no real East Coast, West Coast beef. Oh, you don't like Hammer. Or you don't like Will Smith. You know, just let's just get you to say you don't like somebody. You could be, you know, artists from wherever, from Wyoming, and they're gonna ask you, well, how do you feel about what's going on with such and such and such and such? What about Easy E? So are you happy at Death Row Records now? But I ain't get on the camera to talk about okay. that. The interview nigga asked me a question about it in the magazine. He was like, yo, I heard boom boom, you wasn't feeling with Jay-Z. I was like, yeah, you know what I'm saying? I think you're a bitch ass nigga for saying that, you know what I'm saying? No, I'm not gonna say that. <laughs> come on, <laughs> come on. Now when you make a statement, it's in the paper, you've taken a stance. Bottom line, fuck that fat bitch. When you're new in the game, you, you got an open mouth and you <clears throat> you're not aware of the game they're playing with you. And you may open your mouth and say something about somebody that you didn't have to. Fuck the source, alright? Source can suck a dick. Fuck them motherfuckers. Can we say fuck Tim Dog on TV? Say it. Fuck Tim Dog. When you read your 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 article, that's the piece that's blown up. That's in the big letters. You're like, oh. And the stories kept coming. Rumors that Tupac had sex with Biggie Small's wife. That Tupac Shakur had been raped in prison. That Puffy had something to do with the death of Jake Robles, Suge Knight's close friend. March 1996. A gun is drawn as Death Row and Bad Boy square off at the Soul Train Awards in Los Angeles. As the tensions rose, 
The game's two premier MCs became opposing generals in hip-hop's civil war, whether they liked it or not. So here we are, you know, with this magazine. And we know in the magazine world, even if something says September, it generally comes out like the month before, around the middle of the month before. And so East Coast, West Coast, by September 13th, Tupac is dead. You know, six months later, Biggie is dead. And so this cover is actually uh, kind of eerie, you know what I'm saying? When you see a Vibe magazine, when you see Puff and Biggie on the cover and see East vs. West, niggas in the hood don't read articles. They just see East vs. West. Oh, it's on. It's on. When I see them niggas, it's on. I think Vibe gets a lot of heat for that for that one because it was such a you remember that what that cover looked like, and I think a lot of the people that who probably worked at Vibe at that time still to this day feel kind of like, you know. But Vibe wasn't the only people calling that beef that everybody was. It was crazy. It was just a crazy time, and um, I might say now, you know, I regret the media's role and stuff like this, but we really didn't realize how deep we were into this. Most I mean. If I'm only in my 30s now, I was in my 20s like most of us, you know what I'm saying? We're all kids documenting this thing. We're not even clear who we are, and we're dealing with this, this, this dominant youth culture of the day, and it's taking this very violent turn. It's, it's this thing called East Coast, West Coast. We've never seen anything like this before. And we're just literally swept into it. It was insane, you know? There was no way to know where it was going. No way. You know, like with uh, the Biggie and Tupac battle, you know, there was a lot of people that was not checking to see if Pac could outrun Biggie. They were checking to see who could win in a physical confrontation, whose camps could win if the two met up with one another. As the business of rap music became increasingly like the streets, the artists' crews, made up of close friends, family, and up-and-coming artists, became increasingly part of the problem. They were there to stop. I mean, I've dealt with a whole lot of people that um, involved itself in the streets and brought the streets into the game. And it's like the problem with that is when you bring the streets into the game, they only know the rules of the streets. I got family and I got a big family. You know, one of them dudes, you know what I'm saying, who just had a real big family. I have an extra huge family. <laughs> but even the cops get that confused. Like, you know what I'm saying? The cops start thinking we're a gang and we're this. And they don't understand I just make music. and. You know what I mean? These dudes just support me a whole lot. Some of these dudes just support me from the street and they living this life. Most rap crews are made up of, I say, 50% businessmen and 50% thugs. 50% of your crew is made up of homeboys that just came home from jail. Now, my boys that just got out, I've been the guy on their TV that they've been pointing at. That's my man. That's my man. When they get home, their life is based around maybe I could roll with ice. Maybe ice could help me, you know? Now, what can he do? What can he actually do but say, yo, Blow, Joe Blow was dissing you and I knocked him out in the club. What can he do? So then that thug element is always ready to reach out and touch anybody, whether it's a cameraman, whether it's an interviewer, whether it's somebody on the radio. They do not have any other way of showing the rapper that they they man than busting somebody in their head. And that's where they get they strife. So you gotta understand that thug element is always available in rap. You know, they want them stripes. They want them points. So it's like, even though you might tell a person, look, I really need you to slow down and cease fires and that. Hey, he's a grown man. When you're not around, he might just come along anyway and just, you know, do what he want to do on his own. Then, instead of fighting me like a G, he ran. Now, I can't help it if some niggas that was on the scene beat his ass for running. That was something separate, you understand me? And I can't help it if they were screaming thug life as they did it. That ain't my fault. That's just how shit went down, you understand me? I could not be there, but if I have this person running around with me to the point that you would start associating him with me, and he decides to just go kill a nigga while I'm off doing some other shit, they gonna say I sent that. I've been in situations where I've been with my boys and I'm talking to a friend of mine in hip hop, but his soldiers is sizing up my soldiers. You see what I'm saying? His man just came out looking at my man crazy. I'm walking down the street, my man's like, I don't like his boy. I'm like, you shut, that's my man. But that's they, they animal. 
that's how they that's how they rationalize things with combat. So when you first come out of the hood, you come out of the hood and you were a drug dealer and your friends is drug dealers, your friends is thugs, and you were just a poet that hung out with thugs and you might have been thugged too and you got a record. People around you are very protective. They're very violent. They don't really believe they have nothing to live for. And you are the centerpiece of their lives and you know, and, and you're trying to train them as you learn. It's tough. I mean, Snoop got people that's loyal to him that would probably kill you before he would. But you gotta know how to separate your friends from your homies from your loved ones. I mean, it's, you got homeboys, you got friends, and you got dogs. My dogs is with me all the time. My friends, hey, what's happening, love for I get back at you. And my homeboys is people who I got love for, but they don't understand this business right now, so I have to keep it to a limit. It was times where I had concerts and shows, and I tell a couple people to meet me on my block, on my corner, when I first got signed. And before I know it, I look up, it's like a parade outside. There's always somebody in somebody's ear, like, telling you, fuck that, B. Just that and third. Yo, did that nigga go right there? That nigga said this, man. Why you don't go see him? Because nowadays, I mean, the pressure from your man to make you go hurt some. That's the dude you need to get away from me. Or you got to school him quick, because he don't know no better. In 1995, a crew from Easy es Ruthless Records visited the Dog Pound on the set of a music video. The Dog Pound, because of their allegiance to Death Row Records, were drawn into Dr. Dre's ongoing beef with Easy e Actually, um, Easy e boys, they was just, I mean, me and Ricky Harris was riding around, you know, in a little go-kart thing, getting ready to shoot a scene, and they just walked up on me like, fuck the Dog Pound, you know what I mean? And my response is like, I mean, I'm not, it's about a hundred people around and one of them went behind me. So I'm like, well, either I swing now or else I just get swung on, so. But Skeezy E, rest in peace, I don't know how much he had to do with influencing them to talk about us. But That's they was down with him and we was down with Dre, so they was trying to do their diss thing. And we not trying to be no hooligans. We out here trying to make money because I know that day I felt real bad about what they were It looked real silly. I love this game! <laughs> Fatal Hussein of the Outlaws was part of Tupac Shakur's crew. Due to a court date on the East Coast, Fatal wasn't in Las Vegas the night Tupac was shot. Not that I'm some kind of, you know, gladiator or nothing like that, but if I was dead, I know, you know, I'm, I'm in the streets, basically. The only time I'm not in the streets is when I'm with Tupac, so I know right from wrong. I know. You know, this shit is still a street. And I know there's certain things you can do and certain things you can't do, man. Especially when you at that level. And it's like people that was around him at the time wasn't feeding this to him, man. After a Mike Tyson bout, Tupac Shakur started a fight with Orlando Anderson, a Los Angeles gang member. Several hours later, Shakur was shot in a car just off the Las Vegas Strip. I never stopped thinking about what the fuck was Tupac doing out there rolling in the dirt with a nigga that he ain't had no business even. He shouldn't even gave that nigga the, the time, man, to even say some shit like, yeah, me and Pac had a fight, man. It was like a hundred other niggas there. It was supposed to be people there that was supposed to step up and handle situations. Niggas wasn't around just to be rapping and eating up shit and messing with chicks and shit like that. Everybody in the crew got a part to play. And if you don't play your part, then it's all gonna crumble. And if they get the head, man, what's gonna happen to the body? I felt like if I was dead, shit would have been totally different, man. After the deaths of Tupac Shakur and Biggie Smalls, artists and the media temporarily came to their senses. If you know that it's arousing the whole community, you know that you don't want that to happen. You don't want that energy coming your way, then it's definitely like, up to you to take a stand and be like, yo, I really have no ill feelings towards you as a person. This was me expressing myself through my art. It's love. I want to see you prosper too. I mean, I think a lot of the artists feel that way. They might not say it all the time. 
because cats, you know, do get emotional. Sometimes it, it does become personal. But overall, I know the nature of these cats ain't about, like, I want to see this dude dead. In 1997, Minister Farrakhan called an intervention in Chicago in an attempt to resolve disputes peacefully. Minister Farrakhan told his guests about organized techniques white slave owners had used to keep slaves slaves, including deliberately causing, developing, and maintaining hostility amongst them. Ice Cube flew in, Mac-10 flew in, Ice Cube came and just gave me a hug. When I met Common, Common just kind of felt like he had to defend himself because he a cool dude, actually. And Common good, man. He could rap. He do what he do. And I needed that the elders to come bring us together and just be able to sit us at the table where it wouldn't be no ignorance and no homies just sitting around talking crazy. And we get aroused and just had a peace treaty. And we hugged, you know, so it was like, I needed that. Now we got close, but then she broke to the West Coast. And now it's cool, because around the same time, I went away Because they have the respect of many artists, outside entities like the Nation of Islam and Zulu Nation, as well as individuals like Russell Simmons, Jim Brown, and Mike Conception, have led the way in squashing beefs in hip hop. In the nation of Islam, I'm not even allowed to speak negative of another member to another individual in the nation unless the one of whom I'm speaking about is present. If I go to another member about something negative about another member, that member is to stop me, said, hold up. If it ain't positive, I don't want to hear it. And if it's negative, that other person is not here. So what I do then, I go to someone who can officiate my beef. And I want to witness that I tried to settle it. So I don't fear nobody but God. I don't have to go and slander you behind your back. I think that's a coward's way out. Sometimes the other artist didn't even realize you had a problem with him until he heard your record. See, that's a punk way of doing things to me. That's not being a man or a woman. You should have called that artist and faced them with arbitrators saying, you did this to hurt me and allow that person to say, I'm sorry, I didn't know what I did affected you this way. Would you please accept my apology? We have a hip hop summit here. We have people that work all day long on settling beefs. You know, I've been lucky enough to have an opportunity to, to influence some of these people. And if someone listens to me, then I should use my influence best I can. I pay for a lot of this shit myself. I don't expect to get any help from the people who own the right companies. I wish they'd help me underwrite the Hip Hop Summit because they're making billions of dollars. I don't think that um, people give a shit. Sometimes I don't even think they care if the artist dies as long as the catalog sells. <laughs>